Okay, so welcome everybody for this uh, very special institute lecture uh, uh, at IIT Delhi, and uh, you know we are kind of ending the uh, nearing the end of the semester, and this is some of our last few lectures for this semester. But we are indeed very delighted to have uh, Dr. Sanjay Sani today amongst us. Uh, he's a professor at the National Center for Biological Sciences uh, of the TIFR in Bangalore, and he'll be talking about. Uh, his uh, uh, recent uh, research work on insect flight. I'll leave my colleague, Professor Amitabh, to formally introduce him uh, you know, in, a, in a few minutes and talk about the topic as well. Uh, so thank you, Professor Saleh, for joining us. And uh, it's a real pleasure to have you, have you speak to the Institute community. And of course, this is also being transmitted on YouTube Live uh, you know, for much wider audience beyond IIT Delhi as well. So thank you, Professor Sane, and I would request our Deputy Director of Operations, uh, Professor Deshmukh, uh, to add his words of welcome. Thank you, thank you Professor Shantanu, and welcome, Professor Sane. It is really a pleasure to welcome you. And this is a very prestigious institute lecture series. And we are really delighted to have you today. And as you are aware, IIT Delhi has many departments and centers. And over the years, I would say in last 10, 15 years, the complexion of IIT Delhi is changing and changing at a faster pace than one could imagine. I would say 10 years back, nobody could have thought that IIT Delhi will have a biological school. Now, today we have Kusma School of Biological Sciences. We have interdisciplinary research. My colleagues from mechanical, Abhitab is from Applied Mechanics. They work on CFD, Computational Fluid Dynamics. And interestingly, last year, our Applied Mechanics Department has introduced a new undergraduate program that is on engineering and uh, computational mechanics. And it has got very well reception from the parents as well as the student. And this is basically a step towards having a multidisciplinary research. Many disciplines come together. And I was really very happy to see that you are working on this area. It is very interesting. He has physics, mathematics, and astrophysics before plunging into biological sciences. And that is also a, I would say, testimony to the kind of problems we have in today's world. And typically, coming from engineering discipline, we have a different worldview. Coming from biologist world, the view is different. Typically, from our world, we try to prescribe something. When we optimize something, we try to prescribe. The other worldview coming from biological domain is descriptive. And we would like to learn <clears throat> as much as possible from the nature. And nature offers immense opportunities. And I think that is where we need to collaborate these two distinct worlds and have a unified view in understanding the phenomenon, understanding the learnings from nature. I, as I said, I work on evolutionary algorithm for optimization. And we borrow a lot from nature, what we call it as nature-inspired algorithm, whether it is ant algorithm or particle swarm algorithm and so on. And each one of them provides a beautiful opportunity for collaboration. And I think that is where institutes like IIT have to play a very, very significant role. And I warmly welcome you. And I am sure my colleagues from different disciplines will really like to look at the kind of work you have contributed. And especially, this is also very interesting, you are on the editorial board of Journal of Experimental Biology, one of the highly cited journals. And the experimental, again, the world is different. So merging of theoretical world, borrowing 
largely from nature and especially looking at the insects in an altogether different way because the scale is different the challenges are different and it is i would say a very very interesting phenomenon that how insects have not only survived but they have thrived they have basically and especially in a country like india which offers a huge biodiversity so this is really interesting so engineering community as well as the community from biological sciences they have to come together and look at the world in an all together different manner and we are really very eager to listen to you because this will also set stage for motivating especially young researcher in the collaborative domain where biology and engineering come together so once again i warmly welcome you and thank you very much for accepting our invitation thank you very much thank you thank professor. you very much uh, professor deshwant and uh, may i now hand over to uh, professor amita bhattacharya for applied mechanics department to introduce the speaker and uh, take this forward amita. thank you uh, professor roy and uh, professor deshmukh uh, it's a real honor <coughs> for me to introduce uh, professor sane professor sane is he's he's professor at the national center for biological sciences tata institute of fundamental research in bangalore india He got his bachelor's degree in physics, chemistry, and mathematics from Saint Stephen's College in University of Delhi, and a master's degree in physics from the University of Pune. And he pursued his doctoral work at the University of California, Berkeley, in the lab laboratory of Michael Dickinson, where he focused on the aerodynamics of insect flight. His postdoctoral work was with uh, Tom Daniel at the University of Was Washington, where he investigated the role of antennal mechanical sensors in the control and stability of insect flight and his laboratory at ncbs focuses on a diverse range of questions arising from the physics of physiology of sensory and motor processes that guide insect wing movements during flight in miniature insects he also studies collective building of nests in diverse insects i should just add that his work has been published very very widely in in uh, very prestigious journals and uh, i and he has also written some very nice uh, uh, pedagogical articles especially on insect flight uh, which are a real joy to read and uh, so that's why i think uh, uh, we are all uh, looking forward to especially looking uh, to to sharing his uh, talk today so with that i would like to hand over the mic to mr sam thank you thank you very much uh, amita uh, thank you very much for inviting me it's always a pleasure to uh, talk to engineers especially this is my community from the past from the dim and distant past i should add uh, and yeah i mean a lot of things that uh, were just said uh, by professor deshmukh resonated with me i think yes it is really important uh, for us for engineers and biologists to uh, collaborate uh, this is a topic that i have you know been involved with for many many years and i'm sort of i feel sometimes like i have i'm a person standing uh, with one foot in one boat and another foot in another boat and just both of the boats are going to different direction uh, but you know it, given that so many of the tools that we use and the concepts and principles that we use come from the engineering sciences I, and i hope my talk will uh, And at least implicitly, if not explicitly, uh, mention some of these. Um, so, thank you very much for inviting. I, I'm really happy to be here. Um, before I start, I just wanted to know if you could see my cursor, and also to request if there are any uh, mics uh, open and they could be muted, so that uh, there won't be uh, uh, stray noises. Um, if that is possible uh, can i is my cursor visible yeah i don't think you can yes yes it is visible yeah thank thank you very much so so thank you very much and you know i'm going to talk today about miniaturization 
Uh, this is uh, an old picture of NCBS. It is now much more sort of developed. In the back here, you, would, you won't see the skies any, anymore. But uh, I like to keep this picture, you know, as a it gives me some nostalgic joy to see it. And to also tell you that my lab is roughly here, no, exactly here, as this is my lab. Uh, and, um, you know, it's I've been here now for more than a decade and it's been an absolutely fabulous place to work. Not in the least, uh, because as Professor Deshmukh mentioned earlier, uh, this is a place which is uh, which has a spectacular diversity of insects. Um, when we talk of diversity, one of the things that naturally comes to mind is the question of uh, how is it? I mean, if one equates diversity with success, in other words, if there are more species of something, then then that particular group must have been successful. Uh, one would ask, why is it the case that this uh, particular group has been so successful? And I'm going to make the case in my talk that at least part of the reason is has to do with the fact that insects were able to <coughs> naturalize and uh, that they were able to uh, cope really well with miniaturization. So with that prelude, I'll just sort of launch into my talk. And I, I, I want to start... Um, just uh, see if I can. Yeah, I want to just start with uh, a video to motivate my talk. OK, uh, I'll, I'll set up the video so then uh, you can understand what I'm trying to actually show you in this video. So what you're going to see is a very mundane event in our lives. We see this all the time, maybe every day, uh, depending on the hygiene in our canteens. Uh, what you're going to see is a fly as it comes up and lands on the ceiling. OK, this is a common house fly, the ones that we see all the time. Uh, but I should tell you that this fly is uh, flapping at uh, a wing beat frequency. Its wings are beating 200 to 250 times a second. So it's an extraordinarily fast um, flapping animal. And the only thing different about this video and what you see on a regular basis is that we film this uh, at a high frame rate. This is filmed at about 2000 frames per second. So, so something that occurs very fast is otherwise uh, invisible to us. <coughs> so we have to uh, film it using high speed cameras. And so what you're going to see is what I consider uh, you know, a, a riveting and absolutely fantastic uh, piece of acrobatics. So watch this animal as it performs this landing. Okay. Now I'll, I'll, I'll show you this video again in a bit, but before I show you uh, what I wanted to um, emphasize is that Everything that you just saw happened in, in, in the matter of maybe about 20 wing beats, okay? 20 wing beats is rough less than 100 milliseconds. Uh, you know, for comparison, our eye blink is about 200 milliseconds. So, yeah, so that's the fastest thing we do. And it's, you know, it's sluggish compared to what a fly is able to do or accomplish in half that time frame. Um, and yet, in this small time frame, <coughs> the fly is doing many things. Uh, it is actually preparing to land. It is landing upside down, which is al already a challenge. Um, and the way it's doing this is that it is watching this square as it expands on its retina. So the fly has eyes on its head, and those eyes are compound eyes. They're very different from our eyes. Um, and on and these eyes are seeing the uh, the the square as the squares that the size of the square increases on its retina, and this tells the fly that it is going to land. Okay, or that that the ball is approaching. Now we did some work a couple of years ago, in which we showed that the fly performs two behaviors as it approaches a ceiling. One is that it slows down, it decelerates, uh, 
and that the onset of the deceleration is actually tightly correlated with the time to collision with the wall. In other words, the fly is somehow calculating the time that it takes to collide with the wall and uh, and slowing down. So if it is going fast, uh, it will it will slow start slowing down further away. But if it is going slow, then it will come closer to the wall before it starts to slow down. So the onset of deceleration is one thing that it does. And the second that it does, which you'll when I show you the video again, you'll see is that it deploys its feet in preparation for landing. It's sort of like the plane, you know, dropping its wheels uh, at the time of landing. I mean, so this is something that it needs to do so that it has a smooth landing. Now, the time when it deploys its feet is quite variable and depends very much on the orientation of the wall. So it's a two phase behavior. One is a fast uh, phase in which it starts to slow down when, when the wall expands on its retina. And the second is a slower phase, which depends much more on the sensory feedback, you know, and the time it takes for it to process all this. So now that I've told you this, I should also tell you that this is not entirely a visual behavior. That for a fly to perform this extraordinary uh, landing, the, the fly also needs to be paying close attention to its vestibular system, very much like we do, uh, we have inner ear system. And, you know, if you were to have a damaged inner ear system, then you would have vertigo, you would not be able to uh, balance properly. Think of this, the fly is, you know, roughly a hundred times faster than us. And yet, and it is in three dimensions, and yet it is able to put together information, both visual and mechanosensory. Uh, its brain combines these informations and is able to generate responses in time frames of a few milliseconds. And that's really the question that attracts me about a fly. Okay. And that's the reason why I went from studying fluid mechanics of the wing um, movements um, and force generation, which I felt was a fairly well resolved question, to trying to study the brain, which is a complete open question. So let me show you this video again. <coughs> With all of this. Uh, in mind. So the fly is doing both of these things. Now, I said that it has a vestibular system. What is its vestibular system? Its vestibular system actually, as you will see later in the lecture, uh, is a pair of hortias, the hind wings in a fly. The flies are of the order Diptera. Diptera means two wings. The normal insects have two pairs of wings, so four wings. Uh, but the hind pair, in, in the case of flies, have turned into mechanosensory organs or rather they are they function like gyroscopes okay so that it's a gyroscopic sensor and so it it is informing the brain about how uh, fast the animal is turning in air and that's how it is able to get rapid information and stabilize its flight uh, here's another uh, video this is a, a close up of the fly so i want you to look at this the wing movement very closely and see how precisely modulated this wing beat is. And uh, you're all engineers, so I don't need to tell you this. For this kind of stability, you need phenomenal sensory feedback. Uh, and so, you know, this system is really one to look at from the point of view of uh, sensory feedback and control. I told you that. Insects are a, a spectacular evolutionary, uh, evolutionary success story. Uh, let's sort of elaborate on that a bit. <coughs> you know, of, of this, uh, there is estimated to be about 6 million, 6 to 10 million species on Earth of all kinds of animals, of which more than 1 million have been described. More than 60% of all multicellular animals are insects. And flying insects range in size scales uh, spanning three orders of magnitude. Uh, I will elaborate on this also in a little bit. 
they occupy a vast variety of ecological niches. There are there's practically no place on earth where we can go where insects aren't already there. Uh, and then the first fossils of insects are from at least 400 million years ago. So, you know, they've been around for a long time and they have, you know, been very, very successful uh, in getting there. So in this pie chart that I'm showing you, uh, everything on the left uh, is insects and on the right is other things. Uh, So let's look at what, what's out there in terms of insects. So the largest insect that was ever found, uh, and this is from fossil record, these insects are now extinct, are to your left. The, this is uh, a, a meganeurid dragonfly. Uh, imagine a dragonfly flying around about 300 million years ago in the Carboniferous period when there was an oxygen peak in the environment, um, which had a wing, wingspan of a little more than two feet uh, long. So from tip of one wing to tip of another was about two feet. These are really large dragonflies. Uh, and these were common around that time. Uh, these don't exist anymore. Uh, possibly because, you know, without the oxygen peak, they can't really sustain their uh, metabolism. The largest extant insect is the Queen Alexandra's bird wing. This is a butterfly. Uh, you can see it in the central figure here, the male and the female. And it has a wing, wingspan of about half the size of the dragonfly. Um, this doesn't exist in India, but uh, the largest insect in India, which is the southern birdwing, is about the same size, just, just slightly smaller than this. Contrast this with the image that you see on the right here, which is that of a small wasp Megaphragma uh, mymeripenne, which is so small, so the, the bar here is about 200 microns. This insect is a little less than 200 microns in size. And for scale, this is a paramecian cell, a single cell. So this insect is comparable in size with a single cell of a paramecian. And yet, if you look at this insect carefully, uh, you will see that it has eyes, image forming eyes. It has uh, antennae, which uh, function really well. It has wings, and these wings are, uh, you know, unlike uh, normal insect wings, which look like paddles, but these are like feathers. Okay. And of course, you would all know that, you know, when, when things are this small in size, uh, the uh, the kinematic viscosity uh, is much greater. And so this insect is, although its wings are like feathers, uh, you know, it effectively acts like a paddle. So, you know, it's a, it's a little bit like running a comb through a jar of honey uh, where, where the comb doesn't anymore look like a comb, but looks like a paddle. So the insect is able to... Uh, generate aerodynamic forces with these wings. So one of the things about insects is that as they grow smaller in size, their wing beat frequency has to increase in order to sustain sufficient aerodynamic forces in flight. And this is because I've put in some equations here, very basic equations. You can see that the flight force scales as the fourth power of uh, its wing length it's a, or a length dimension of some kind, but its mass goes as volume, which is r to the three, right? So what that means is that as an insect gets smaller and smaller, uh, it is it needs to uh, it needs to sort of increase its amplitude uh, in order to uh, generate um, greater forces, it, the wing, to, total wing excursion. However, the amplitude is limited, so at some point it will start clapping and you know it, it can't go further than that. 
And so what it needs to do beyond that is increase its swing beat frequency. Okay, so that's the only way it can really generate the sufficient flight forces. And in fact, this is what you see uh, when we look at the data. <coughs> so on, on, on your left here is the is a plot of the wing beat frequency as a function of body mass, if that's a measure of size. And on the right here is a wing beat frequency as a measure of wing length, if length is the measure of size. And in both cases, these are log log plots. What you can see is that as the insects get smaller, they uh, the wing beat frequency increases. And uh, for, um, less than a centimeter or so, the wing beat frequency exceeds 100 hertz um, and can even go up to 1,000 hertz uh, in cases of midges and mosquitoes and things like that. So this is an extraordinary ask from an insect, from the nervous system, you know, for, for the nervous system to be able to control wings, wing movement at these high frequencies is quite extraordinary. And the real question is, how does the nervous system achieve this? There are other uh, major challenges that insects must face uh, when they miniaturize. One is that the sensory systems now need to sample at much higher temporal resolution because it's just moving too fast. <coughs> the motor system, the muscles, etc., also need to be faster and more accurate. Uh, because even the slightest um, error is going to cause the insect to go spinning round. Okay. Then, of course, they're losing energy on every wing beat. So, somehow they have to minimize energy losses through elastic storage. And in fact, uh, as you may know, uh, from a materials perspective, uh, there's a material called resilin, which is the most efficient rubber known to Uh, yeah, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, can you still see my slides? Can you still see my slides? Yeah. It's yeah. Fine. Yeah? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. All right, sorry about the loss of network. It's a strange problem. And the final thing, so I, I don't know where you lost me. Uh, did I, did you hear about resilient? Yeah, started, we just started talking about We started it. talking about it. So maybe you could just start, take off from there. Sorry, I can't hear you. 
So you started talking about it actually. Okay, I, I will repeat it then. <coughs> so what I was saying was that when an insect wing is flapping at uh, so many times uh, during flight, you know, 200 to 250 or 300 or 500 times a second, every uh, in every stroke it is losing some energy, um, either due to heat or due to, uh, you know, viscous losses. And this, this energy loss must be minimized, otherwise the insect will very quickly run out of fuel. And the way it does this is by, uh, it, it has a material called resilin, which is one of the most uh, efficient rubbers known to us. It's about 97% efficient. And uh, this is present in its hinge and it is able to return a lot of, uh, a lot of the energy that is stored. And that's, uh, you know, present only in insects. So it's, it's really a remarkable material. And finally, there will be other things like water losses or heating and things like that. And, you know, all of these are problems. I mean, if one were to try and build a robot that were to do all of these things, you would very quickly run into major issues. And yet, you know, you can see insects fly, you know, very effortlessly. And uh, they are able to actually adapt very easily to problems. Like if, if you clip off a little bit of its wing, they're still able to fly without a problem. So it's a remarkable system. So I've uh, summarized all the challenges um, of miniaturization in this particular plot, uh, in, in this particular diagram <laughs> or a summary figure. <coughs> and so I'm not going to go over these in uh, too much detail, except to say that, you know, one, one major problem is when you try and shrink the eye to a miniature size, then you quickly run into the issue of resolution. So uh, as you may know, the insect eye is a compound eye. So it has many facets. It's a, think of it as a, you know, many pixels. But when you shrink the eye, beyond the point, you can't shrink the pixels because you run into diffraction limitations. And so that means that beyond a point, you can't uh, make uh, a, a particular um, facet smaller. <coughs> and so you just need to have fewer facets. And that means that the insect eye would be, uh, will have fewer pixels and it's not as well resolved. So these really tiny insects uh, have poor resolution eyes. Insects in general have poorer resolution than us, but uh, smaller insects are even worse. I already talked about wings. Uh, you know, wings are feather-like in many cases, not all, uh, and they uh, they have enhanced wing amplitude. They clap. Uh, they they undergo this clap and fling behavior, which uh, I have studied in the past, and which was first described by Weisfog and uh, Lighthill, who's a eminent fluid uh, mechanics. Uh, personality in the last century. Then, of course, there's the issue of how far can they fly? If they're so tiny, how far can they fly? Well, they can't fly very far. So then they run into the issue of how can they disperse, which insects need to do in order to spread. Uh, and the way they do this, among other things, is by hitching ride on other insects. And then there are other issues, like, you know, the 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 architecture of the thorax, uh, the architecture of the flight muscles, which I'll talk a fair bit about, and of course their antennae, which again contain fewer sensors, and so they need to somehow deal with that. Um, so it, there are many challenges uh, led uh, by miniaturization, which the insects must deal with. I'll just show you one video, despite these challenges. Uh, this is uh, a creature that we've studied in the lab. It's called Trichogramma. And what I want you to see is that this insect actually makes a living by laying its eggs inside the eggs of other insects. So this insect uh, injects its eggs inside the eggs of other insects. So you can imagine how small this egg is. Uh, it's the egg of moths. And this insect is smaller than that. 
and it in fact will push many eggs inside and then you know wasps will come out <coughs> and watch how it goes by this uh, job you can see that sampling with its antennae now it's made a decision and there it injects the egg Let's play this again this is an intelligent animal it is able to sense its environment and make decisions, despite having a brain that's extraordinarily small. <coughs> I already mentioned about vision, so I, th these are just some images uh, to show you what that looks like. Uh, these are this, these many facets of a compound eye, and you can see that it's you know it's it's not actually many facets. Uh, so these are all, each bump here is a pixel. And here's the wing, and you can see that this one is more paddle-like, <coughs> but has fringed margins that effectively enhance the area of the of wing. Um, here's a film of the insect as it flies, and it's a really a difficult film to get because the insects are so small and using high-speed cameras providing sufficient illumination, you almost fry them uh, in the process of trying to illuminate them. <coughs> and you can clearly see that they clap on every big stroke, and that clapping actually has is very interesting to fluid mechanists, um, including to me um, when I was studying these questions. Okay, so let's launch into a little bit uh, of biology and try to get you to understand how insects are able to um, flap at such rapid rates, okay? So one possibility might be that you have the nervous system uh, drive each wing beat. However, the nervous system cannot operate that fast. And so, you know, dipteran wings flap at frequencies on the order of 100 hertz or higher, and this is just not possible through direct neural stimulation. Instead, what we have in insects is a very interesting kind of a muscle. It's called a myogenic muscle or an asynchronous muscle. And what you can see in the plot down here is uh, the case of an insect with synchronous muscle and low wing beat frequency, and another with a high wing beat frequency and an asynchronous asynchronous muscle. And if you notice that whereas the wing movement in this case is one-to-one -one correlated with the muscle activity, right? In other words, each uh, nervous impulse causes a wing beat. <coughs> in this case, you have about 10 wing beats for each nervous impulse. Okay? Now, how is this possible? This is possible um, because the, these muscles have an interesting property. And that property is called delayed stretch activation. In other words, what happens is in the normal, uh, in the normal muscle, <coughs> such as in a locust muscle, if you were to stretch the muscle, if you, if you were to pull it, then the muscle would, uh, you know, respond with some stress. However, in the case of a beetle, if you were to uh, pull the muscle, extend the muscle, then the response comes slightly later. It's called delayed stretch activation, okay? And that's shown in the lower plots below. <coughs> so this, this muscle reaches its peak stress uh, well after the uh, strain has been imposed on it. This is called delayed stretch activation. Now, what this means, the implication of this is that, um, let me try and sort of illustrate this using this diagram. Normally I would go to the board at this point, but this is the thorax of the insect, okay? These are one set of muscles. When these muscles contract, the thorax squishes, okay, down like this. When, when these muscles contract, 
the thorax is pulled in. Okay, the muscles can only contract; they cannot extend. Now, what happens is when when the red muscles, so whatever this this color is, I guess red muscles contract. The thorax goes in, but it extends out this way. Okay, and this means that there's an imposition of stress in the horizontal direction. Because this muscle is stretched, it's going to contract. Okay, just as I showed you in, in a delayed fashion. So, what's going to happen is when this muscle contracts, this the green muscle extends, and then it will generate a force, so it will contract after some delay, and now the red muscle extends. And this cycle continues many times for each nervous input. In other words, what we have here is a resonant system. Okay. And this allows the insect to bump up its wing beat frequency by a factor of 10. And this property of asynchronous uh, uh, flight muscle, okay, or straight delayed uh, stretch activation. So this is a diagram to show you what I just told you. So when the DVMs, the dorsoventral muscles, uh, which is these red muscles contract, then the wings go up, but the green muscles extend, and when then the green muscles contract, the DLMs, the dorsal longitudinal muscles contract, the red muscles extend. And so this cycle uh, causes um, the wings to go up and down uh, many times a second, okay? Uh, so uh, many times in one uh, nerve impulse. <coughs> okay, so what does this have to do with the success that insects have seen? I'm going to make the case now that if you look at the insect family tree, this is called a phylogeny in, in evolutionary biology. So on this phylogeny, you have all the insects. So up here are odonates, which are like dragonflies. Then you have uh, blatodia, which are like cockroaches, etc. But there are five insects that stand out as being hyper diverse or being extraordinarily successful. Okay, these include uh, bugs. So hemiptera, beetles, coleoptera, beetles are actually spectacularly successful. They're 38% of all um, insects. Diptera, flies, which are about 13%. Lepidoptera, which are moths and butterflies. And hymenoptera. <coughs> now, the interesting thing is that all of these ones that are pink, contain both the myogenic and the IFM, the indirect flight muscle architecture. The indirect flight muscle architecture is just this architecture in which the muscles connect to the thorax rather than the wings. Okay, so they, what they are doing is pulling the thorax, not directly actuating the wing. So both of these uh, together, whenever they come together, you see extraordinary success in insects. And you also see higher wing beat frequency. So something very interesting happened in the course of evolution, which was when the property of the myogenic muscle evolved, uh, we, the insects could now set up this resonant system, which en enabled its wing beats to be very um, high frequency. And this allowed insects to miniaturize, because that's the demand of miniaturization, that the wing beat frequency goes up. And this means that insects uh, became very successful. So this is how they deal with the problem. So many, uh, well, not that many, but some years ago, uh, there was an extraordinarily bright student that joined my lab, uh, Tanvi Devra. She's actually from Delhi. Um, and she got interested in this question. And she asked the question, how is it that insects can be so fast on the one hand, but also so precise on the other hand. Normally, as we know, um, you know, the faster you try to be, the less precise you get. Um, those of us who play cricket and bowl know this painfully, that if you try to bowl too fast, then, you know, your precision goes awry. It's the same 
it should be the same uh, in other cases too. But in the case of insects, it doesn't seem as if this increase in speed has in any way cost the insect. So how does it? Uh, how are insects able to achieve speed and precision during flight control? <clears throat> we decided to study this question in in a, a system of soldier flies, which I've uh, shown in the video here. <coughs> and if you notice carefully, this white structure, which is oscillating antiphase to the wings, these are the halteres. These are the gyroscopes that help the insect balance. If you look at the base of the haltier, so that's the haltier, the base of the haltier is full of these mechanosensory neurons or mechanosensors, which are detecting the strain, the engineering strain, this, you know, the deformation of the base of the uh, haltier. Okay, so the haltier vibrates in a plane, and when there's an externally imposed change in the plane of rotation, because of the conservation of angular momentum, there are Coriolis forces at the base of the, uh, on the uh, RTM. And these are transduced by these sensors, which then communicate this information to the uh, central nervous system, which then uses it to determine how fast the insect is turning. And it then, you know, exercises control or uh, compensatory wing movements based on that information. All of this is happening within milliseconds. So that's what a haltier looks like. And as you can see here, this is, uh, uh, you know, the haltier is connected neurally to the wing uh, motor neurons. So it exercises direct control on the wing motor neurons, which then allows the wing to um, correct its uh, wing motion whenever there's an inadvertent change in direction. The hot ears are very important, by the way. So I, I, this set of four videos will uh, drive home that point. So the video that you're just seeing is that of a normal insect as it takes off. As you can see, this insect is able to modulate its wing motion as it requires, and you know its trajectory is remarkably smooth and very very uh, accurate. If you now go in and cut those hot ears, okay. This is what happens. This insect can fly, but it has lost control completely. It's like a drunken fly, uh, which is absolutely no control. And that's because, you know, it's effectively uh, like a fly with a vertigo. It doesn't have information about its um, its uh, own motion. <clears throat> you might ask what happens if you just cut one hot ear and not the other, and you see predictable problems. So this insect takes off, but very soon becomes unstable and starts spinning in one direction. This is where the left hot ear was ablated. However, if you ablate the right hot ear, you'll see that it starts spinning in the other direction. Okay, so this insect takes off, for a while it's okay, and then at some point it loses stability, and you can see that it now spins in, in the opposite direction. So these are predictable differences. Now, I told you that <clears throat> there are two things happening here. One is that the, the wings are moving exactly in phase to each other, and the haltiers are exactly anti-phase to the wings. And when I say exactly, they have to be very precise because even the slightest mismatch is going to cause the insect to uh, become uh, completely um, unstable. So our hypothesis going in was that maybe this is a scenario where the wing sensory neurons are <coughs> um, coordinating with the haltier motor neurons. And tell you know if the haltier goes up, then the wing goes down. Or the hortier sensory neurons uh, drive the wing motor neurons. So that antiphase motion is something that you know we needed to explain. Or it could be a single neuron in the lowest picture here, which tells the wing to go up and the hortier to go down. But then we had another hypothesis. She said these are not an exhaustive 
set of options. So maybe there is also mechanical coupling, and this would then exclude the nervous system entirely and just focus on the mechanics of the insect flight. Yeah. And so this was the hypothesis that she first checked. And I'm, I'm just going to play this out. Uh, Oh, sorry, there was a, an unwanted volume. I'll just cut that and I'll play this again. So, was that uh, video clear? So, I just. It was clear, yes. So, you know, the interesting thing to observe there, I'll, I'll play it again, is that when the wing, this was a dead fly, so we took the nervous system out of the question, but when the wing moved up, the hot air moved down, okay? So I'll play this again. This was a really surprising result because what it meant was that the nervous system was not involved in this coordination. It, it was entirely a mechanical, uh, uh, mechanically connected system. So thereafter, Pua Tanvi, who had actually joined my lab to train as a neurobiologist, uh, started to study the mechanics of the problem, biomechanics of the problem. And that's where uh, her project took her. And she did, I must say, an outstanding job uh, of, of uh, figuring out the solution to this problem. So let me just describe what it is. So here's the thorax of the fly, uh, and the back of the thorax, uh, there, there are two uh, parts to it. One is called the scutum, and one is called the scutellum. The gray part is called the scutellum. And if you look at the thorax from the side, this is the scutellum. If you notice, the scutellum has these arms that come right under where the wing should be. Okay. In other words, this, this is a link between the two wings. So we knew that this is a mechanically connected system because when you move one wing, the other wing moves. So there must be some connection between the two and also the haltiers move. So there must be some connection between the wings and haltiers. So what we then ended up doing was a series of experiments <laughs> that uh, revealed to us what these mechanical connections were within a thorax. Uh, and these are summarized in the video that I'm now going to show you. Uh, this video has commentary, so the commentary should be self-explanatory, uh, and I hope you can hear it. But please tell me if you cannot hear it. This movie summarizes our findings on the biomechanics of wing and hortier coordination in flies. Our study shows that precise coordination between wings and hortia is achieved not by the nervous system, but by mechanical connections within the thorax. A structure on the thorax, the scutellum, links the two wings. Rapid coordination of the indirect asynchronous flight muscles drive the motion of the scutellum, which causes simultaneous in-phase movement of both wings. When this link is severed, the two wings become uncoordinated as shown in the next video. Thus, the scutellar linkage is necessary for wing-wing coordination. Although the two wings are not coordinated anymore, the haltiers on each side oscillate antiphase to the ipsilateral wing. When the two wings become uncoordinated, the haltiers also become mutually uncoordinated. We next showed that the wing hortier coordination is mediated by a separate mechanical linkage, the subephemeral ridge, which connects the wing base to the hortier base. When the subephemeral ridge is intact, the wings and hortiers oscillate exactly antiphase with respect to each other. However, when this link is lesioned, 
wings and hot ears become uncoordinated. Notice that the hot ear continues to move through its full amplitude, driven by the asynchronous hot ear muscles. The hot ear on the right side, whose link remains intact as an internal control, continues to oscillate exactly antiphase with the contralateral wing. Thus, the subepimeral linkage between the wing and the hot ear system on both sides are independent of each other. If the wings and hot ears are constrained to move in synchrony by mechanical linkages, how do insects achieve control of just one wing at a time? To address this question, we propose the hypothesis that there exists a clutch at the base of each wing, which can engage or disengage the wing from the mechanical linkages. When the clutch is engaged on both sides, the two wings flap together. However, when the clutch is disengaged on one side, one wing remains folded whereas the other can flap. Apart from the clutch, the base of the wing contains a gearbox. Once the wing is engaged, the gearbox controls the amplitude of each wing. If we zoom into the base of the fly wing during active flapping, we can see the wing hinge. It consists of a radial stop shown in red, a plural wing process shown in yellow, and Terale C, a putative mechanosensor and damper shown in blue. The radial stop contacts plural wing process in four different modes. Mode 0, 1, 2 and 3 as shown here. In this scanning electron microscope image, we see how the radial stop connects with the plural wing process in four different ways from mode 0 to mode 3. Here is a video of the wing engagement at the start of flight as the radial stop moves from mode 0 to higher modes. Notice the shift in the wing amplitude from very low to very high within a single wing stroke. Once engaged, the wing hinge shifts between the different modes and the wing moves at high amplitudes. This is akin to the gear change operation in automobiles. During flight cessation, the wing abruptly transitions from high amplitudes to low amplitudes within a wing stroke as seen in this video. When this happens, the radial stop moves from higher modes to mode 0. So at the end of these set of experiments, this is the, uh, the model that we came up with. This model is uh, that of a dual uh, oscillator to two coupled driven oscillators. So you have the wings which are driven by their indirect flight muscles, the hot ears which are driven by the hot ear muscles, and then these are coupled by the wing hot ear linkage. The wings and wings are coupled by the scutellar linkage. And so what you have is a mechanical device essentially that is able to operate in perfect synchrony. And then any control over and above it is uh, exercised by the use of the gearbox, which then allows the wing to move through more or less amplitude. Now the question is, how is this gearbox controlled? And uh, I oh, I should also mention that you know we've done a series of experiments in which we tested this hypothesis, and uh, you know I won't go too much in detail in there except to say that we showed through through those experiments that the wing hot ear linkage was a weak coupling. It was a case of a weak coupling. So if you look at the green and red plots here, when you perturb the frequency of the wing, 
the haltier keeps pace with it up to a point, but beyond that it cannot, even though the link is intact. So that's that's a weakly coupled oscillator, uh, whereas the wings and wings uh, are tightly coupled. In other words, both wings will do exactly the same thing, no matter how much you perturb their wing wing uh, beat frequency. And this system therefore uh, ensures robustness against wing damage, even if one of the wings breaks uh, or is cut into you know a little bit then although the wing beat frequency will increase the two wings continue to uh, operate at the same frequency uh how much time do i have left i, I just have about five more minutes Fine. Yeah. So, uh so the Additional control of the wing hinge comes from these muscles that are shown here. These are all many different muscles, and I, I will show them in a, another movie. Uh, this is uh, a micro CT imaging of the muscles that underlie the wing hinge, which is a really complex and absolutely fascinating structure. Uh, you know, you wouldn't have thought that inside of a fly has something like this uh, in terms of its mechanics. So what you see here are the wing hinges, and now this is the scutellar lever arm. This is the part that connects to the other wing. And then you have these parts of the thorax. Now each of these is actuated by muscles, a, a set of muscles. So the first part is actuated by these two muscles. Then the second part has no muscles. A third part, a small sclerite here, uh, is actuated by many muscles. Uh, so these are uh, the, the so-called three muscles, three, one, three, two, three, 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 four muscles. And that's the lot. And then the uh, fourth axillary sclerites are uh, again actuated. Can you see me now? Sorry, I thought I lost connection for a bit. Hello? Hello? You are audible. I'm audible. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'll continue with the movie. Sorry. I'll, I'll just play the movie again. So this is the base of the wing hinge. Uh, as I mentioned, so this is the radial stop. This is the part that engages with the gear. Uh, this is the putative mechanosensor. This is the part that connects to the other wing. And the sclerites are basically parts of the thorax that are hardened and they are actuated think of it like an origami uh, piece right where there are different folds and those folds are actuated by muscles and so those different folds are being controlled and so these are all muscles that are actuated by motor neurons that underlie them and those motor neurons are getting their uh, marching orders from the nervous system uh, which is processing all the information from the sensory system. And so there are these, all these muscles that together actuate various parts of the wing hinge. And this is what allows the wings to move through those absolutely perfect motions that they are controlling as the fly uh, is landing on the ceiling, for instance, or doing those barrel rolls or you know interesting maneuvers of that kind. Um, so this is the um, this is the wing hinge in its full glory, uh, and we are able to do this now because of micro CT. Uh, and I must again say that all of this work was uh, this one absolutely brilliant student who uh, I was lucky to be uh, advising. Uh, and she, she's been 
absolutely stellar. She's currently a postdoc at the University of Washington and um, very keen to actually come back. Uh, so if, if you guys are hiring, then I would uh, look no further. Um, so I'm nearly at the end of my talk. So, you know, what I'm showing you here is a video again of, of the kind that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. This is the video of a fly landing. And as you can see, this extraordinary uh, behavior, we now understand it a lot better because we now know that in the, this fly, for instance, if I play this movie again, if you notice, as it comes close to this particular object that it's going to land on, watch what it does with its wings. The wings are being plotted here, but the wings are going to their full amplitude, but somewhere here, suddenly the amplitude will go down. And we know now that this is happening because the fly is essentially going into some sort of a neutral gear. It's like going into a neutral gear before you arrive at your destination. And that's essentially what the fly is doing. And this is my last slide uh, to show you that, you know, what we have seen is just a tip of the iceberg. If you look at the left, there's a fly chasing another fly. And you can see that these maneuvers are absolutely stunning. I mean, some of a part of this, uh, behavior, the fly is flying upside down and it is chasing this other fly with a degree of um, aggression that you wouldn't ascribe to flies. And you can see that it slams it against the ground. And this is what a fly does when it is, uh, you know, guarding a territory. This is your common flies, okay? They, if you watch them closely, you'll see them do these things. On the other hand, if the fly uh, finds a female, then it is a, a gentler fly. It actually carries the female around and it will uh, fly. And you can see that the amplitude is very high because it's carrying the weight of two insects. And then it deposits this insect and then takes off. So that's where we really want to go with this. I mean, we understand the mechanisms of how some of these things happen. We don't understand all of the mechanisms, but many of them. But we'd really like now to go back and ask, you know, how are these extraordinary maneuvers possible? So I'll stop there. Uh, these are all the people who have, you know, directly or indirectly contributed to the talk and to the research in my lab, uh, funding agencies. I, I should be particularly thankful to the uh, US Air Force uh, Office of Scientific Research, which has been very, very generous uh, in supporting me uh, through almost my entire career as a professor. They've been very um, good about uh, being excited about my research and sort of, um, you know, giving me funding with very few strings attached. Uh, on the aerodynamics front, I, I continue working in that area, uh, but now in collaboration with Shinyan Deng at Purdue, with whom I have a long-standing collaboration. So we've reconstituted the um, RoboFly. The, this there was a device that we had invented to study uh, aerodynamics, which is now uh, in her lab. And uh, that's where I get students from mechanical engineering. Uh, and so that's uh, been a wonderful collaboration. Uh, on the... Uh, issue of insect wing coordination and miniaturization. I've um, collaborated extensively with Getty Hassan, uh, who was my colleague here at NCBS, and Namrata Gundia, who's a colleague at the Indian Institute of Science. She's also my better half, um, and their students and my students. Uh, and there are many other projects besides which I, maybe at some other time I, I, I would be happy to talk about. But thank you very much. Uh, this is the lab uh as it is today uh in fact this is now a little bit dated a few of the people have left and some new ones have joined but thank you very much thank you thank you professor sani a really wonderful talk uh, i think I, I at least learned a lot of things and uh, it was very surprising for me to know that there is a gearbox inside insects and uh, uh, it was very impressive to actually see how you had uh, uh, sort of uh, taken apart the whole mechanism and, and uh, 
uh, managed to understand everything there. Uh, so for the audience, um, I think they can post their questions in the chat box uh, in WebEx. And uh, I think in the YouTube also, uh, YouTube may, is there any audience right now? YouTube may have questions here. Only one question is there, okay. So, uh, okay, maybe the, because uh, in WebEx right now, I'm, I'm not seeing any questions. So maybe YouTube will have a question can you please show. So, uh, Abhishek, I hear he is asking whether halters are types of wings. So maybe you can answer that. Yeah. 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 They are actually wings. Uh, they are wings which have uh, sort of shrunk in into, um, you know, they've lost all their uh, aerodynamic properties and they are instead now mechanosensory organs. <coughs> These mechanosensory organs have evolved from wings. So what used to be the hind wing, if you look at a dragonfly, it has two pairs of wings, so four wings and hind wings. Uh, but then if, you know, if the hind wings were reduced now to mechanosensory organs, and that's really what a uh, here. Okay. Okay, on WebEx, um, uh, okay, uh, Bishwara Mukherjee, he's saying, he's, he's uh, first said that uh, fantastic talk, Professor Sane. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, I would know, I would like to know what, what the ev evolutionary advantage, advantages of miniaturization would be. Yeah, so I think the greatest evolutionary advantage of miniaturization is access to uh, ecological niches that would otherwise not be accessible. If a fly or a wasp uh, can make its living off of other insects, right? Then, then it vastly expands its ability to diversify. So it's just access of resources. The smaller you are, the more resources are available to you, uh, because you know you can diversify into many different areas. You can enter little crevices, all sorts of things, uh, and that's really the the great advantage of miniaturization. But there are many other advantages. You know, one of the advantages is that predators can't see you. So you're not, you know, you're much more safe. Uh, it's also, you don't need too much resources. So you can actually expand your populations a great deal. Uh, so you can have, you know, typically smaller insects have many, many, many offerings, uh, et cetera. I mean, there's many, many advantages of being miniature. Uh, thank you. Uh, Abhishek Ahir has, I think, a follow-up question, which is that, uh, sir, do you think for higher temporal resolution applications, mechanical uh -huh. systems are better than nervous systems in nature? Um, for, I mean, so I in, so there, the, there's two answers to this. One is, you know, if you look at engineered devices, then clearly that is not true. Um, you know, we, we have electronic systems that can be really, really fast uh, and accurate uh, at the same time. Uh, but for biology, nervous system is certainly a, um, um, a rate limiting step when it comes to uh, being too fast. And, you know, I, I think in a sense, what I've been trying to show is that what you need is both, but both have to operate in a, a particular kind of resonance for uh, speeds to increase or for, you know, for uh, higher temporal resolution. Okay. But it's really meant to uh, do with what it has, yeah. Professor Amit Gupta, uh, he is asking that based on your experience of working on insect flight and the mechanical coupling, how do you think changing environment, ambient conditions, that is gust, temperature, humidity, etc., they affect uh -huh. flight and stability? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, you know, and that, that's again partly what we have been trying to sort of get at is how does, for instance, you know, 
I mean, what I've shown is that there's a lot of passive uh, mechanisms that are operating. For instance, if you clip off a wing, this is an example of damage, but you might increase the temperature and that may cause a similar uh, issue to occur. So in, in all of these systems, what may happen is that there would be an externally imposed change in uh, in wing beat frequency or, you know, in, in the control uh, system. But because there is a, a lot of passive mechanics uh, built into the flight system, therefore, uh, what, what happens is that the insect is able to cope with it. So, you know, a little bit of wing damage, no problems. The insect continues to fly as if nothing happened. Uh, it is able to turn, it is able to control itself without much problem. But this is a question that Tanvi and I have really sort of addressed more squarely in a paper that is just uh, in revision right now. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, that, that's essentially what we've been talking about. Not temperature so much, but damage. Uh, so this is a uh, next question is from Professor Ashish Darpe. He says, mm -hmm. first of all, he says, excellent talk uh, encompassing biology and mechanics. Can we really call it a geared system or a levered or a leverage system for manipulating the wing amplitude? Yeah, I think technically you should call it a levered system, uh, except, you know, in, in, in the terms of what we understand as gears, uh, the analogy is uh, sort of more intuitive. Uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, we, we're still sort of trying to understand how it works, but I, I do agree with uh, Ashish that it is technically more like a levered system rather than geared system. The, the, the term gears I'm using in the following sense, which is that it is in different modes, uh, and so it can go from one mode to another, and that changes uh, its... Uh, it's leverage. So, uh, next question is from Nalin Pant. Mm -hmm. He asked that uh, delightful talk, uh, first of all, he says, and then this is uh, any thoughts, comments on the construction materials? More to the point, what, what should we be looking to mimic with engineering synthetic materials? Uh, depends what you want to do. Um, but if you, if, you know, for instance, I talked about resilin. Uh, resilin is a absolutely fantastic rubber. I'm, I'm, if you've seen this movie called Flubber, you know, in the Disney movie called Flubber with Robin Williams, which has a similarly efficient rubber, you know, that's really what resilin is. Uh, it's, it's just a, it's not the product of uh, fantasy, but it actually exists and it's 97% efficient. So, you know, something like that, if one could synthetically, um, develop and i think there are some efforts ongoing in that direction then you know this this could change everything uh because we could then uh reduce uh energy loss uh in in any of these mechanics systems that we might need it. Okay. Uh, somebody has so i think sunil nath has raised his hand, but uh, um, I don't know if he can... Ask him to put his question. Maybe if you can uh, uh, put your question um, on the chat box in WebEx, that would that would help. Because I think we can't allow uh, audio questions right now. Yeah. Can I ask it? Can I ask it? Okay, uh, I guess if he's sure. already there, you can ask. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's a lovely talk, but I think the puzzle is, is, is not answered. I mean, when we looked at this problem, we found that uh, the ATP consumption rate of uh, insect flight was 1900 micromol per uh, gram per minute, which is 60 times greater than our skeletal muscle. So uh -huh. the question to you is, are there any differences in the molecular structure or architecture of insect, in, insect flight muscle? Mm -hmm. And if there are not, and if there are not, why can we not match this? Uh -huh. And that's an excellent question, and in fact, there is a difference between the uh, muscle architecture of the stretch-activated muscle and uh, the typical skeletal muscle that we have. Um, and 
I could go into that, but the short answer is yes, there is a difference. Uh, the difference is in the spacing uh, between the uh, myosin filaments uh, of the muscle uh, and the actual binding sites. And so, uh, it derives its uh, stretch activation properties from that. Okay. Uh, so I don't. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. okay so this is Pritha. Um, I'm neither yeah. a biologist nor uh, an engineer. So my question might be slightly off track. But I'm just thinking about the phylogenetic tree you had on uh, one of your initial slides, and mm -hmm. you mentioned you kind of brought in the issue of um, the success rate and uh, the rate of sex, uh, evolutionary success. And I was just wondering, where do you place in that phylogenetic tree uh, wingless insects, you know, for example, ants? And what comes to my mind is the, is the behavior of the Saharan ant, which, mm. um, which you know, can, can navigate through the, through the desert mm. without any mm. overt landmarks. And just come mm. back in a straight line, um, mm. and basically the navigation initially yeah. happens in a zigzag fashion, and it comes back to its nest right. in a straight line. Right? So that's one thing. Of course, there could be a chemical use. Um, just to you know, get the smell, or or you could even use the or the, the uh, you know your location. You could assess your location uh, dependent on the sun's uh, position. That is one. So where do you place these? Um, how successful have they been in terms of you know evolutionary adaptation? The other uh, insect that I have in mind is a honeybee, because as a linguist, I find it fascinating that they have developed a whole range of bee dances, and these differ from. Um, you know, one kind of honeybee to another. So Italian bees are one kind of bee dancers and Austrian bees have another kind. Um, and, and, and a lot depends on, and they can of course convey distance and direction of the, of the nectar, uh, source of nectar from the beehive. So where do you place these? Because it seems like even within the, you know, the range that you show, there seems to be a lot of uh, wide array of cognitive diversity right. going on there. So, um, I can answer both questions. Uh, firstly, ants are wingless secondarily. They are not actually wingless. Uh, in fact, uh, you, know, they, uh, you know, they do fly around when they need to mate, uh, and then they get rid of their wings. So, ants are not technically wingless. They are winged insects. And bees, uh, both ants and bees, are uh, of the order Hymenoptera. Okay, which are successful, highly, they are among the, you know, the groups that I showed as being highly successful, right? Uh, so they are both hymenopteran insects, as indeed are wasps that I showed you, the miniature wasps that I showed, uh, you know, which went around the egg and so on. They are also hymenopterans. Um, you brought in a really interesting topic, which is of path integration, which is a really kind of a separate topic. Uh, but, I, you know, since you brought it up, I think it would be fun to talk about it. Uh, there are these Tunisian ants that, uh, as you mentioned, you know, they, they come out of their um, nests and then they go in a zigzag path to look for something. This is in a highly, uh, very hot desert, so 50 degrees outside. And this fly and these um, ants will go all over the place but when they find food they take the shortest path back to their nest this is called path integration and the way they do this this has been the subject of uh, extensive studies not in my lab but in the lab of rudiger werner um, who showed among, among others i mean there are many others uh, bees do, by the way, something similar. You know, they can also go all over the place foraging and then come back in the shortest, fly back in the shortest path to their hive. Uh, in all of these cases, you know, th there's some interesting navigation going on, and that's, you know, primarily in the brain, but they are using celestial cues also. They're using, for instance, the polarization cues um, in the sky, and that allows them uh, to do some of this uh, path integration, but they're also uh, able to do other really interesting things like counting steps, for instance. And you have to try to count steps. And you can do specific experiments to show that if you make their legs longer, then they over overshoot their nest. Or if you make their legs shorter, then they 
undershoot the nest exactly by the predicted amount. So it's you know it's a really fascinating question. But in terms of the success, you know all of these different things do contribute to their success. So it shouldn't surprise us to see Hymenoptera uh, on that uh, list of hyperdiverse, very successful insects. But they are all Hymenoptera: ants, bees, wasps. Thanks. So there's a couple of more questions. So one is from Nipun Arora. Um, it has a very broad scope. I think it's uh, the question is that can you draw some light on insect dynamics and maneuverability? Uh, how do insects uh -huh. turn and roll? Uh -huh. Good to hear a question from Nipun, uh, who uh, I met uh, some years ago when during his PhD thesis. Um, yeah, so um, how do they maneuver? Uh, well, so if, if you think about maneuvering, it's a very complex and controlled, uh, controlled in the engineering sense uh, behavior. You know, for a, for a maneuver to occur, uh, insects must really know what they are, uh, what their sensory feedback is, and then it should be it, it should be you know in a negative feedback loop of some kind. So it's it's it's, it's a perfectly stable system. And then it is able to actuate. So I, you know the real sort of um, effort. I won't give you an answer. Or I'm just telling you what the what the effort is. Uh, is it trying to understand what the sensory uh, inputs are? And I've just told you about vision and I've told you about mechanical sensation. These are the principal ones. Um, but how they are interpreted by the nervous system to generate, uh, you know, the this concert of activity in muscles. I mean, I showed you all these different muscles. And, you know, all of these muscles are being controlled by the nervous system. It's like a concert with many instrument lists and something that is really telling each one uh, you know what uh, what each muscle should do and that's really what's going on except this is doing it you know in a few milliseconds so the effort really is in trying to understand a what the structure of all those muscles are so that and how do they you know control this extraordinary wing hinge which is causing the wings to control uh, to be controlled and then you know how do the wings actually control so you know, the wing on one side can do one thing and the wing on the other side, but both of these must act in concert for a role of a particular angular velocity. And that's really what the whole thing is about. So I, I don't have an answer to the question, but I'm just sort of opening up the question and telling you what the components are. So the last question is um, that uh, with such advances in AI and ML, mm -hmm. how long do you think it will take to develop an insect-based, uh, uh, fully controllable MAV? Uh, I mean, it's a continuum. You know, we already have MAVs that are controlled by AI-driven uh, algorithms. Uh, you know, we can argue about how complex they are or, you know, how much further they need to go. Uh, but, you know, this... There is a large number of labs already working on this, including uh, the lab of Shinyan Deng, who is my collaborator. But there's also a group in Harvard and, you know, uh, across the world, I, I would say there are at least 50 groups working on these kinds of uh, robots. Uh, there are many more and more recently there, there are fewer, uh, you know, lots of competition in this particular area. But I think we're there. I mean, you know, uh, the the direction in which these MAVs have taken actually, even at the beginning of all this, back when I was a graduate student, I was part of one such effort. And at the time, we had two directions. One was uh, to go with the quad rotors, uh, you know, which we already established. We knew exactly how to control them. <laughs> and the other was flapping MAVs. Okay. Now, over the years, people have realized that the flapping MAV problem from an engineering perspective is a far more difficult problem. 
uh, for all the reasons that I just mentioned, you know, uh, it's it's there's much more wear and tear. There's it's much more difficult to control it, whereas the quadrotor, you know, is a is a much easier problem. And I think engineers, rightfully so, have focused more and more on the control aspects rather than just kind of getting the robot off the ground. So with quadrotors, that was a solved problem. With uh, flapping devices, it was, you know, kind of difficult. And I think they wanted to sort of cut to the chase. So more and more we see quadrotors, quadrotor-based robots, and less and less flying, uh, flapping MAVs. Um, and I think the quadrotors have been extraordinarily successful. I mean, today, you know, you see them in marriage ceremonies and whatnot. Uh, somebody controlling a robot, taking pictures, whatever. I mean, they've become sort of part of our daily life now. Uh, lots of drones and things like that. Okay, so I think that's uh, all with the that's it with the questions. Um, oh, one question. I, I think, uh, yeah, so Deshmukh has a question. Yeah. Oh. This is slightly off the track, but uh, there is a general view that all creatures, they are like automata. Mm. They are basically programmed to do what they are supposed to do. Now, do you think that this view basically simplifies our effort in modeling the biological system? So this view comes to us from as far back as Descartes, uh, René Descartes, uh, you know, in his uh, discourse on method, propounded this view. And in some regards we cling to this view still i have worked with insects now for well, more than 20 years and i have to say that i disagree with this view that you know insects are no more or less robots than we are they're thinking creatures they are remarkably intelligent in their frame of reference they are able to do things that we can not even think about i mean the just the first video that i showed is a is a classic example of uh, you know fabulous decision making extremely fast sensing that we can only dream of you know actuation that we can only dream of so you know this is an intelligent creature it's just that it it is not intelligent in quite the same sense as we think of intelligence uh, but the fact that it has survived you know for 400 million years and will survive for 400 more long after we are gone uh, suggests that this is actually a, you know, not a, uh, not a, uh, not an automaton, I would say. Um, so you can actually, you know, any any time anyone has gone in and tried to sort of show that it's an automaton, uh, they've they've not been able to uh, convince themselves or others of this. And one person who has really sort of been remarkable in this uh, is Martin Heisenberg, uh, the son of Werner Heisenberg, uh, who did some extraordinary work on flies and uh, has, you know, shown wonderfully that flies have something, you know, that um, they, they have spontaneous behaviors and they, you know, they act on their own volition. So, so that's how I feel about it. So I think actually that makes it more interesting uh, because I think the question of really, you know, what is this animal thinking and how is it thinking and how is it processing the world? This is the key question. The mechanics is a solvable question. We can get to it. Uh, the, the neurobiology is where I think the action lies. Uh, and so that's really what drives us to keep studying them. I don't know if I've answered your question, but that's my that view. Is, that, is, that is interesting because I think that keeps the challenge alive. Because yes. otherwise it will be having a very, very mechanistic outlook. Mm. That's and right. there will not be any fun in modeling. Yes. So on a personal note, would you call yourself as a biochemist, biomechanist or evolutionary biologist? Uh, I I think a little bit of both. I'm I'm you know if if there's any label that I'd 
likes to stick on myself. It's a, it's a neuroethologist, the person who likes to study the neural basis of animal behavior. Uh, and in as much as animal behavior cannot be studied without understanding mechanics, um, or you know, without it is subject to evolutionary forces. I, you know, I go in whichever direction. The problem. You can call me a recovering physicist. <laughs> <laughs> because somehow easier. we have this habit. We want to level everything. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, part of my effort, I mean, when I first joined NCBS, they asked me which department I wanted to be part of. And this to me was such a difficult question because I didn't want to be part of any department or I wanted to be part of all departments. Um, and so I, you know, I, I still haven't quite answered that question to myself. It's wherever the problem takes me. If it's physics, I'll go there. If it's mechanics, I'll go there. If it's neurobiology, I'll go there. Evolutionary biology, whatever. Uh, because the animals don't think about these labels, right? They will just do what they do. I mean, that is the interesting. <laughs> yeah. Thank <laughs> Thanks a lot. It was very enlightening. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Sane. It was, it was wonderful. I think it was very, very exciting. I think all our imagination was fired with the movies, and it was yeah. fantastic, actually. It was really, really refreshing. Thank you very much for joining us, and thank you for your time. And, thank you. Uh, we look forward to having more interaction with you. Thank sure, you so much. Sure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Such a wonderful thank audience. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.